Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fourth annual Meeting Challenges Exploring Solutions Conference. We're very happy to see you here. My name is Leslie Painter Farrell. I think a lot of you know me already. I've recognized a lot of people. It's lovely to see so many returning faces. Um, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of people to get something like this off the ground, so I'm just going to say a few thank yous. So Charlotte uh, and Charity, so Charlotte Turnbull, who's running around, and Charity Vince, who's upstairs, they've helped a great deal this summer to put together this event. I also have to say thank you to the readers, who are Leo Schmidt, who's in the audience, Caitlin Morgan, uh, Jackie Smith, who's in Italy right now, missing us. Uh, not too much, but is missing us. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Oxford, uh, Nat Geo, and Pearson for helping sponsor the event today. We've also got nice TESOL here. Um, as you'll see, there's a lot happening in the events cafe, so please go down there. We advertise the outreach program. Roshi Jolly, who's the outreach coordinator, is around. Please feel free to talk to her about that. There she is in the audience. Um, so please enjoy today. I'd like to um, just say thank you for coming out. I know it's a rainy day, but it's a worthwhile day. There's lots to do, and one of the things to just tell you is on your name badges, there is a number, and that is because Leo Schmidt is running a raffle midday, so please make sure you go to the Events Cafe because your number might be it, and then you'll get some wonderful books from the publishers. So without further ado, I want to introduce our plenary today, Lourdes Ortega. Um, we're extremely excited to have her today, not least because her, <laughs> your book, uh, Understanding Second Language Acquisition, is actually our core text for the MA TESOL. So many of the students who are here today will recognize, hopefully now, the author. Um, Lourdes has many accolades, but what I'm going to say is she is the Professor in Department of Linguistics at Georgetown University, but at the moment, Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Advanced Research Collaborative CUNY Graduate Center in New York. I hope I got that right. So without further ado, Lourdes. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Leslie. And I also want to start by thanking Leslie, Charity, and Charlotte for their organization and for bringing me here. I'm so pleased to be here. And I look forward to uh, attending uh, presentations during the day and talking and meeting with many of you. Um, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint. Something, I hope, not all the rest of the, of the PowerPoint will show like this. <laughs> um, with, I think we did check it, but OK. But anyway, um, if you email me or if you email uh, Leslie, you can get the PowerPoint with the references um, if you're interested. And I want to thank uh, my university, Georgetown University, for allowing me to take a sabbatical this fall and the Graduate Center at CUNY for giving me a wonderful fellowship that has placed me here with you today. So I wanted to uh, reflect on teaching adult ESO students for success and what it may take for us to do this well. Um, what are we supposed to teach in order to ensure success for our students? I think most of us will answer that it depends on great part on who our students are. So how many of you teach ESO adults? Oh, that's a lot of you, good. <laughs> how about adult immigrant or refugee students specifically? All right, also. And international college students? All right. How about students in K through 12? All right, one person over there. One person over there, great. And other? Great. What? A community college, yeah. Anyone else who raised their hand? What other kinds of students? Business executives. All right. Um, and there are so many other kinds of students we may be teaching English over our professional life, right? But when we think how to teach uh, to them for, for success, oftentimes our answers are going to slightly change depending on who we are teaching and who we have in mind. So what are we supposed to do to ensure success? And we all think we're teaching for English competence, but then what does that mean in reality? 
Traditionally, we think of language and we think of issues of accuracy with the grammar and pronunciation, um, a large size of vocabulary. Um, since communicative language competence has been um, the way we mostly teach since the 80s, we also think about the ability to use language um, using norms that are contextually uh, sensitive. Right? So the grammar, the pronunciation, the vocabulary needs to be tailored also to the contextual demands and the norms of different communities. In, in the year 2000, I did a study with my colleague uh, John Norris. We were both doctoral students at the time. And we were investigating whether we had enough evidence to say that teaching grammar makes a difference. So these were all studies from the 80s and the 90s. And we concluded oops, that grammar will definitely, teaching grammar will definitely be um, um, effective, um, especially if all we look at is the tests we give students afterwards, right? And that teaching it explicitly, explaining rules, giving explicit feedback, tends to lead to better results, once again, if we teach students on tests. So we have a very large literature now talking about uh, how to balance communication and grammar, and we have very good researchers who have written a lot of uh, articles and uh, pieces for teachers as well as for researchers talking about how to balance grammar and communication. And we have curricula since the 2000s emphasizing depth and breadth of the contexts and the contents and the cultural knowledge that we can include in our teaching for our students. So we have uh, curricula that are project-based or theme or task or content-based. We have courses for specific and occupational purposes. And we have even um, a lot of materials and a lot of uh, courses that are geared towards developing interculturality and global citizenship when we teach English. So in the 21st century, is it enough then to say that we're going to include all of this in our teaching? communicative language competence, considering all three dimensions, and that with that, we will be working well to ensure that our students develop competence and success in English. Is it enough? Will they become competent in English if we just do this? Well, many students do feel competent, and if we teach them all those things, they will feel that they have a handle on English and that they're meeting their goals. But there is also a lot of insecurity among our students. So if you think about it, every time we teach someone English, we are actually teaching multilinguals, right? By definition, they already have other languages, and we're teaching them to add and uh, cultivate English as one extra language. When I say mu multilingual, what do I mean? I do not mean people who are born to more than one language from birth. It doesn't need to be native-like or passing for a native speaker. I don't even mean perfectly equally proficient in the languages that the multilingual speaks. All I mean is simply functionally able to use more than one language for one's own purposes in life. If my purpose is to give a talk, to an audience, then I need to have enough English for that. But if that's not my purpose, then my kind of English doesn't need to measure up to a situation like this, right? So English speakers who are second language speakers are, we must think of them as English knowing multilinguals. And this really repeating ourselves this, at least to me, it helps. But, have you ever noticed how much linguistic insecurity we, who most of us are multilingual, and our students, who all of them are multilingual, feel? This is a quote from a very famous bilingualism researcher, and he explains this idea of linguistic uh, insecurity in this way. Many bilinguals have a tendency to evaluate their language competencies as inadequate. Some criticize their mastery of language skills. Others strive their hardest to reach monolingual norms. Others still hide their knowledge of their weaker language. And most simply do not perceive themselves as being bilingual, even though they use two or more languages regularly. And this experience is constant. When I ask my students or my colleagues to raise their hand if they think they're bilingual or multilingual, 
Very few people do, and I know for a fact that they are bilingual or multilingual. So how does this linguistic insecurity arise? I think it arises from imagining language as self-contained and explained by the sum of grammar books, dictionaries, and large corpora, by the language that the educated white middle class people speak, listen to, and read, by thinking that there is a perfect correspondence between language and meaning, and also that there is one language at a time and no mixing. When we think that language is self-contained and explained in these ways, then we are instilling insecurity, linguistic insecurity in our students and in ourselves. It's basically when we're thinking of learning a language as a ladder to educated native speaker perfection. Many textbooks, many courses, many of our teaching practices, many of our implicit and explicit comments to our students can actually be of this kind. Implicitly, we may be thinking that what we're doing together is getting towards the educated native speaker perfect English. That is the idealization that we all live with. So for this, as an antidote, we have to think of the openness of language. Normal language use, how we all use it, is greatly diverse. We don't speak only in standard. We don't speak all the time only educatedly. And we don't always speak middle class, even when we are middle class. Plus, we all want to feel our languages are us, a matter of identity. So this EFL student in Japan, for example, in one study um, by Samson, made this comment. Do you want something to drink? It's like a textbook. It's not me. But want something to drink? It's like I'm actually saying it. That's like my image now, like it's me. Yeah? So the bookish English with the complete question doesn't feel like a young Japanese person trying to learn the English that he wants to learn. But a little bit more of a colloquialism, that feels like it would be him, right? Plus, there's always a lot going on in language that is uh, context-specific. For example, take ordering a meal, which is in many textbooks. We may choose the type of establishment and think, for example, of fast food, and we, meet, we may give our students social roles when they do a role play, for example. One person is the counter worker, the other person is the customer, right? And then we teach them how to handle that situation in English. But what about social goals and social framing? Things like, while we're ordering, we're thinking and worrying about our allergies, to make sure we're not ordering the, right, the wrong kind of thing. Or we may be wanting to go to a movie afterwards, or we suddenly realize that they're going to charge us for the ketchup, right? And so as we're ordering the meal, all these things are also happening, and we may let them be part of our language action, right? So we may want to express anxiety as well, we may want to implore someone to hurry, or we may articulate disapproval. So there's so much going on in anything we do with language all at once, very context specific. Plus, there is no perfect correspondence between what's said by language or even how many languages we know or don't know and the meanings we are able to make. Consider what goes routinely into making meaning. It's a lot more than just language. This example is from Li Wei. What does this mean? I love New York. What does this mean? I love Greece. Only those of you who know the Greek flag could know that, right? But consider both. In the first one, we may argue that there is one word, I, and we may argue there is a little bit of syntax, yeah? A one-to-one -one correspondence. I love New York, yeah? But in the second one, we don't even have the correspondence with a full syntax, right? So how are we making meaning out of these things, right? With whatever bits of semiotic repertoire we have, 
because meaning making is always multi-sensory and multi-model. Consider Facebook. Um, this July, I was going to a conference and I posted this on my Facebook page, looking forward to the 11th International Conference on English as a Lingua Franca. And then a friend of mine, an old friend of mine from Spain, replied, Que bien Lourdes, mi segunda lengua favorita, el horror English. <laughs> so, what does it mean? Can anyone translate this? In your head? Yeah. Que bien Lourdes, mi segunda lengua favorita, el horror English. What does it mean? How do you know what it means? Some of you because you know Spanish and a little bit of English. But others, you may not know Spanish and you may still have gotten what this means, right? And what was this speaker doing? Hor English is how I'm pronouncing it. But maybe it was or English, right? So the blend, we don't even know if it's English-Spanish or Spanish-English, because horrible is a cognate in Spanish and in English, right? So it could be horror English or it could be horror English, right? So there's so much ambiguity, so much meaning, and you can get it even when you don't know Spanish, perhaps, right? So that's the openness of language. And if we know more than one language, they're always on. So this is the, the fact that the languages of a multilingual are interconnected, identifiable, but inseparable in the mind. And so psycholinguistically, we never use one language only, and we never use one language at a time only. In our head, if not overtly, we're always on with all our languages. Yeah? And so that's the proposal that if all humans and bilinguals always translanguage, then we can use that in our own pedagogy for the purpose of supporting linguistic confidence and for the purpose of allowing normal language processes to take place for better learning. So in sum, the openness of language is about understanding that normal language used by all of us is greatly diverse. It's not only standard, not only educated, not only middle class. It always indexes who we are. It's always specifically designed for a context, for purposes, interlocutors, intended impact, and one's visceral emotions. And also understanding that normal language use is translanguaging, that we always use whatever bits of semiotic repertoire, that we always have meaning making that is multisensory and multimodal, and if we have more than one language, then we never use one language only or one language at a time only. But there is another step that we must take in order to be able to teach for success our English-knowing multilingual students. This is thinking about what language learning really is about. Everything about language learning is social, interpersonal, built on intentional biographical repertoires and constrained by unequal power relations. So, let me give you some examples. One with an adult um, ESOL student. This comes from a journal that one of my students was writing for one of my uh, master's classes, and I'm citing it with permission from her. She said, once I had a student who kept saying, I came from Korea. I tried to correct her grammar by saying, if you are originally from Korea, you should use present tense when you refer to it. So, you know, at a party, first time you meet someone, small talk, they look at you, they hear you, they see you, and they start asking, where are you from? Right? Uh, some of us may get upset, some of us may think that that's very natural. Um, there's been some study of how it is or it is not a microaggression. Uh, but it's a very common occurrence. Where are you from? And then we have to say, from Los Angeles or from wherever, right? And this person kept saying, I came from Korea. So my student then went on writing in her journal. She said, 
Since I don't want to go back to Korea and identify myself with American, I'd rather say I came from Korea and wish to be an American one day. So suddenly, this whole thing was not about a grammar choice. It was not an error. It was not not knowing what the past tense means. It was an intentional, very well chosen choice of grammar to convey an intended meaning that was very important for this person, right? My teacher was horrified. <laughs> what do I do? How do I respond, right? And there are many ways of responding. I won't get into that. Another example, Eva, an immigrant from Poland in her 20s. Um, she was in Canada. Do you know who this is? Does any, anyone in the audience who doesn't know who this person in the t-shirt is? No, no hand up? Okay. So this is in a study by Bonnie Norton Pierce where Eva retold the story of the Bart Simpson t-shirt to the researcher. Right? And she said the following. The coworker was pointing at the t-shirt and Eva said, I don't know who that is. So the coworker said, how come you don't know him? Don't you watch TV? That's Bart Simpson. And Eva told the researcher, it made me feel so bad that I didn't answer her nothing. Until now, I don't know why this person was important. <laughs> so, making, fe feeling like a foreigner, like an outsider, like an ignorant adult, right? An example from an international graduate student. This is one of my graduate students, uh, and I say it with permission. Uh, writing in a journal, this person said, I did not think I was weak in my grammar, but when I got comments from a lot of professors about my grammar, I still feel I'm not a legitimate academic writer. Their comment made me, make me to think I'm not academically appropriate, but still need to go to ESL English classes to fix my grammar. I feel often I'm a long-term patient in a hospital to get a 10-year-long surgery. This is loaded with negative emotion, right? So what's learning, language learning about? It's about language, of course, but it's also about social context. It's about identity and emotions, agency and ideologies. And there's even more to it. It's about power and social transformation. People want to use language so as to be seen, heard, and judged in desirable ways, however they define desirable, in their actual and in their imagined social worlds. That's what we all want in whichever languages we have. So we humans are competent in language when we know to claim the right to speak, when we have the power to impose meanings, and when we know how to use English so so as to be seen, heard, and judged in desirable ways defined by ourselves based on our actual and imagined social worlds. And yet, this is not an easy task to do when we're learning English, right? Our students frequently feel oppression. They're being positioned by others as a novice, a foreigner, an outside member, or a non-native speaker. They're being told that their language is not good enough, implicitly and explicitly. They're being promised that language will open doors in life. We often make that promise as teachers, right? But will good English open all doors in life? Is it just about language and how well we speak a language or not? Of course it is, in part, but it's about race and ethnicity, it's about class, occupation, and wealth, it's about religion, sex, age, sexual orientation, any other number of isms that exist in any community or in any society um, will intersect with language learning. And whether we feel empowered to use English competently and successfully is not just only about how much English we have or we know, but it's also about how others view us, us and our competence in English. And I wanted to just put an, an example from a 
remembering what it felt like living in New York after September 11th. Lena, a hijab-wearing fluent English Arabic college student who was the designated language broker in her family uh, commented this in a study. Well, if somebody was being racist or throwing something at us, me and my mom, I wouldn't have to translate that to my mom. I try to avoid, avoid talking when that happens. Yeah, in New York, things like that used to happen. If I am translating something to my mom or speaking to her in Arabic, I get a dirty look from someone passing by. But now, it has been 10 years or so since 9-11, but in New York, four or five years after 9-11, it was still very bad. So she was very fluent in English as well as Arabic, and her fluency in English didn't save her, obviously, from these kinds of um, events. So our students frequently experience oppression, and do they feel they have the right to speak? Do they feel they have the power to impose meanings? We should be able to help with that too, as we teach. A note on language ideologies. It is through ideologies that humans oppress and are oppressed. And language ideologies are ideas about language structure and use, which index political and economic interests of individuals and the social groups and nations to which they belong. So ideologies are not neutral, they're always interested. Yeah. But they also can be positive and negative. So here's an example from a study that was looking into willingness to communicate. How many times we tell our students, well, if you want to improve your English, you really need to use it, so go find people to use it with, right? Don't avoid using English, immerse yourself, make friends, talk to your coworkers, use English, because that's a very important part of improving in English. But it turns out that in this study, my, my colleague at, at Georgetown, Nick Subtirelu, found that some international students, this was at a university, some international students held a deficit ideology. In the face of difficult uh, communication, unpleasant, difficult, hurtful communication, these speakers would blame themselves 100%. It was my fault, I need to improve my English, I'm a non-native speaker, yeah, 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 I need to study more English. Yeah, 100%, it's my fault that this interaction caused me uh, embarrassment or apprehension or just uh, negative feelings. And yet, there were also other students who held a lingua franca ideology. These students reported the same kinds of difficult encounters, difficulties using English, unpleasant reactions from interlocutors, <laughs> traumatic types of things happening to them. And yet, when they were explaining these events, they blamed it 50-50 to their English, but also the blame also on the other person. And they would say things like, well, that interlocutor or that, that person wasn't that interested in talking to me, you know? Or, well, that lecturer, they don't explain things so well. Yeah? So they would acknowledge that, yeah, maybe, you know, I need better English to understand the lecture or to make friends in English. But at the same time, it was 50-50, you know? The world around me is not perfect English speakers who adore me and want to help me learn English. It's a 50-50 uh, two-way road, understanding and having successful communication. Yeah. So who is going to better, be better off with their English learning? The person who adopts a deficit ideology and blames it all on themselves and their poor English, or the person who is a little bit more defiant and says 50-50. It's not just my English. Yeah? Obviously, a lingua franca ideology will make people not avoid getting into situations where they have to use English, and the more they use English, the more they're going to improve. 
So many students develop empowering strategies of resilience and agency to transform their worlds and negotiate the liabilities of being multilinguals in our ideologically monolingual societies. And we should be able to help with this. This is also part of what we need to put into our classroom. We can help our students examine their own ideologies of language learning and support them to transform the negative ones into positive ones as much as possible. So how do we look then at competence in English in this other way? So traditionally, we have the communicative competence. But if we want to have empowering communicative competence, then we need to think of adding whatever we think can help us meet this other goal which is helping our students know how to use language, English, so as to be seen, heard, and judged in desirable ways that they define as desirable. And so what does this addition add to the contents of what we teach? Probably it needs to include awareness that the world is full of Englishes, and there are many Arabics, and many Spanishes, and many Dutches, but that multiple languages are always unequal languages. Languages don't just simply coexist, they exist in a hierarchy. Right? And that there is linguicism around them and in the world. They need to understand that linguicism exists, they need to recognize it, and they need to be able to develop their own strategies to fight it off, to resist it, to identify it as linguicism that can be blamed on the other, not on themselves. Yeah. We also need to include in our curriculum and our teaching imagination. Uh, language is about identity choices, so we need to understand, to make our students share that understanding with us. Communication is about power struggles. Uh, negative ideologies exist, but positive ideologies exist too, and positive ideologies make for a happier multilingual. Yeah. And we need to think of the imagined communities and the desired worlds that our students bring to class, which may not be ours. They may have very different imaginations of the kind of English that they feel they would be cool if they could speak it, or successful if they could speak it, or liked by others if they could speak it. And we need to think of how to work with them on strategies so that they can turn around the struggles of being a non-native speaker, a foreigner, an outsider, an adult who doesn't sound like a competent adult a lot of the time, into resilience and self-advocacy. And the ideologies of language, uh, language teaching, if we're teachers, language learning, if it's our students, they must be included also in what we teach because we have to be aware about these ideologies, recognize them and rethink them. So empowering communicative competence perhaps can be summarized um, in a few principles. First, we must think all the languages of my students, new and familiar, are equal keys to success. All of them count, not just English. It's English in multilingualism. I can't teach my students effectively if I turn my back and their backs to the openness of language. If I forget how language really works, because I'm too immersed in my textbooks, my rules, my contents for communicative competence or intercultural competence, and I sort of lose sight of how language really, really works, which is messy, imperfect, ambiguous, full of complexities, and a very effective tool for communication beyond language. We also must keep in mind the roadblocks to success my students encounter are as much because of who they are seen to be by others as because of their not good enough or not good enough yet English. It's not only about language. Not all doors are going to open if, if English is wonderful. Right? 
and in my curriculum and in my daily student interactions, I must make space for my students' open multilingualism and for resisting self and other generated negative ideologies, developing self-advocacy and building resilience. So the educational imperative is to teach language as open and to support resilience and agency in our second language students. How do we do this? It's a really tall order, I know. But I think it can only be done by each teacher examining themselves, their students, and their context, and attacking in two fronts at once. On the fly pedagogical work, how we respond on the fly to things that happen to our students and in our classrooms, and through curricular work, through well-planned curricular work. But we have to work with our students as they struggle to imagine and enact alternative, more inclusive realities. So in conclusion, there is a big distance to travel from the traditional communicative language competence, which is already daunting and very complete, and we have a lot of knowledge and skill for doing these things quite well by now, but also these other things that come with wanting to learn English so that we know how to use it to be seen and heard and judged in desirable ways by others. And for this, we need the awareness, the imagination, and the strategies, both on the fly and through curricular choices and decisions. So my personal tips, well, I think try out shorter trips. It's a long distance be between what we do and we could, what we could be doing. But try out shorter trips that take you as far as you're comfortable first. No teacher should ever do anything that they don't feel at least slightly comfortable with, right? Too much comfort is not good, obviously, for anything in life, but a little bit of comfort is needed if we're gonna take risks and try out anything new. And don't travel alone. Always recruit the company of colleagues and of your students. And in the end, what matters is not reaching the goal of the journey, but what matters is all the reaches that the journey will have given you and your students in trying out to meet this very tall order. So I am going to finish with literature. How many of you love literature? Yeah. Language teachers often, we often love literature. So I wanted to finish with a very well-known uh, couple of verses from a Spanish poet, Antonio Machado, from Seville, southern Spain. That's where I'm from. Um, very famous verse that says, Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. Wanderer, there is no road. The road is made by walking. Thank you very much. And I think there is a follow-up se session. So anyone who wants more conversation on this, I'm very happy to engage. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Uh, um, I'm working now with some students from... Can you hear me? Yeah, I couldn't see you. I don't okay. know. <laughs> <laughs> That's less important. Um, I'm working now with some students from Spain, hmm. and they are working in a corporate context in Midtown. They're, they're computer consultants for international banks. And uh, there's a young man who's actually pretty, uh, speaks pretty well, uh, but he w told me that any mistake he makes in the office gets used against him in a kind of nasty corporate politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, for instance, he thought, he saw the word tobacco spelled, and he said tobacco. Uh, and they made huge fun of him. And he asked me what he should do. And I honestly didn't know what to say. I said, you know, you weren't crazy to think that. It could have been tobacco. And it, it, the, the pronunciation rules in English are not always clear from just seeing the word written, because it, it, there could have, it could have gone a number of ways. But he asked me what he could do almost more defensively uh, with uh, these people who, by the way, are older than he is, senior to him, but he is trying to help them introduce uh, 
different software that they're resistant to accepting. So they're, they're, it, it gets very nasty because they, they're trying to discount him. They're, they're using language to discount his business yeah. message. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a very good example of the, the politics of language and power, language learning and power, in a context that overall is quite uh, affluent and, and affirming. Yeah, this person is here doing a, a high pay, good job, and having a professional identity that is very uh, solid back in his own country. Um, I think, well, there are several things that one can respond and do for the student. One is to actually help him find some pronunciation courses. Um, and sometimes they're online, they're, they're small modules, but you know, the person will feel probably good if they invest a little bit of time every day into some pronunciation building, and it may help, uh, not just because maybe the pronunciation will improve, but also because it may build some sense of, I'm doing something about it for myself, right? So that's one response. The other response is to help the person understand what's going on in terms of the power that is the discrimination of power that is being exercised on him so that he doesn't just simply get out of this, my English is poor, that's why people make fun of me, but more like the message, the empowering ideology reading of that would be these people are quite racist and nasty, even though they're my bosses and even though I want to get along well with them, Every, every time this happens, it's on them, not on me, right? So an ideology that uh, builds defenses and resilience against this constant microaggression. And the other thing is also reminding the person that if any of those people tried to say tabaco in Spanish, they would actually also not pronounce well. So turning it over, we can't let our students forget that they know more by being multilingual. It's not their deficient English. They also have all these other things that the people who have the good English don't have. So it's this kind of English plus sense of identity. And sometimes, I mean, like in everything else in life, you can't go against your, against your bosses necessarily, and you can't fix the world. But it's how we analyze the situation and whether we feel like we're doing something about it and whether we're building defenses against it that can help us navigate it a little bit better. And pronunciation. There's a lot of research on how to, to get much better at pronunciation, whatever our level is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm not saying that that isn't necessarily the case. It, it probably is what, what happens, but I find that very frequently um, our students' own insecurities amplify their perception of what that was. They'll see a smile on, on the person's face, and maybe they thought it was a little funny, but they didn't mean to uh, humiliate yeah. the, the speaker. But their own insecurities uh, just expand it, and, and, and they perceive it as, as humiliating. They feel humiliated, and they just yeah. want to shrink. And they, really, they don't say anything, yeah. and it really silences them, but it wasn't necessarily intentional. Um, and I focus a lot on, 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 on helping my students to overcome their own insecurities and how they deal with those situations. Yeah. Uh, roll with the punches, um, laugh with them if, if that's, that'll disarm them, mm -hmm. it, and, and it, it enhances the, the relationship they have with the people that they're speaking with. Yeah. Um, it, it creates a, a, a less stressed uh, atmosphere and conversation. Yeah. And then they can ask, oh, and how do you pronounce that? My best students are the ones that have conquered their insecurities. Uh, they don't take these things personal. And they use those moments as learning moments for themselves. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good uh, point. And I would also endorse some of those strategies. Um, only that we have to be clear that insecurities are not just inside the person's mind and their own responsibility and doing. It's not, uh, it's not their doing. The insecurities come from public discourses, from daily encounters where apparently nothing was intended but every time we get hurt. 
And so there is a fine line between treating it as a hypersensitive person who gets offended um, by things that weren't ill-meant. And so there is a lot of research on this notion of microaggressions, not just with language, but with gender, with race, with sexual orientation, where the person who is minoritized in that particular context by their pronunciation, by their sexual orientation, by their race or ethnicity, whatever it is, feels hurt and comfortable and insecure in response to something that is said to them and how that psychologically over time is like having tons of mosquitoes every day bite you. They really affect your life, your health, your psychological health, etc. And how you cannot put the finger on why you were slightly upset or deeply upset. Like, well, but it was just said as a joke or it wasn't really intended in any particular way. Why do I get upset at it? And so we have to negotiate how to how to explain that to our students. It's not that they are hypersensitive either, right? So the meaning of what's happening is both in the person who issued the comment about tobacco and the, the laughter or the smile, but also in the person who receives it and how they feel it and interpret it. And neither one is right or wrong, but the fact is when you're hurt, you have the right to be hurt. And if something is racist, oftentimes the person issuing the inadvertently racist comment will say, oh no, I didn't, it's not racist, it wasn't intended to be racist, right? And so we get into all these very difficult conversations about, is it about intention or is it about effect on the other? Right? So I do endorse those kinds of roll with the punches, try to strategize to make it into, you know, smile with them or do something else. But I also worry about treating it as if you have an insecure personality, they didn't mean anything, and uh, you're a little bit hypersensitive. That also I would worry a little bit about. Thank you. I think there is, uh, I agree with both. However, I was wondering if you have any comment on a trend that we are seeing in federally mandated testing in public schools where we ask the parents of what they call 2L speakers in what we say is just good business but is in fact a massive microaggression. Could you just opt out of the federal test please because uh, we're we got to keep our numbers up. They don't tell them they have to keep their right, numbers right. up. But is there any research you've seen on that about how that affects, because if you started in third grade mm -hmm. by telling a child, uh, yeah. can you please opt out of the test? By the time they're in high school, if they don't take the test, they don't get a diploma. Yeah. Uh, and they move that microaggression on for about 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, testing can do a lot of harm, even though sometimes it also can do some good uh, washback effects, saying uh, including writing and testing makes the teaching of writing a lot more possible, um, including speaking and performance-based uh, types of testing makes the curriculum much more oriented towards performance and real tasks. So not everything in testing is evil, but a lot is and especially standardized testing and testing for high stakes. So I think there is not just even the students and the parents, but also the teachers who suffer a lot with the, the scores and all that. There is some research showing the effects of testing on uh, how the curriculum changes for the worse, how teachers um, are desperate and feel very oppressed by testing. Not just language tests, but also all kinds of other tests. And I think there are some testing researchers who still work towards social justice in testing, trying to change some things. And a, a hopeful area is doing uh, tests in classrooms as opposed to the high stakes testing. So getting students uh, used to testing situations that are a little bit more formative and less summative 
and that are a little bit more under the control of the teacher and not of the big testing companies that, that send the tests to us. But definitely the messages in education, not just about language, but about academic performance, um, do have a huge impact on students. Conversely, uh, the monolingual ideologies of teachers in schools, especially non-language teachers, can also do a lot of harm. So um, there have been studies showing that when teachers think one of the problems why these students are not doing so well academically is because they're not speaking enough English and because they're speaking other things at home and not English at home. Those teachers have lower expectations of students. And those ideologies actually are quite firmed up in schools that have a very large presence of low achieving diversity students. So it's not that teachers who are in contact, contact, daily contact with a lot of diverse student bodies develop this idea of multilingualism that is celebratory and non-deficient uh, oriented, deficit oriented, but actually daily contact can make teachers develop these negative ideologies that say, the reason why in math and reading this person is not doing very well is because they're using too much English and at home they don't use English. They're, they're using too much of another language, they don't use enough English. And that actually lowers their expectations and so they teach differently to those students. So it's human, it's human to develop messages and ideologies that are harmful to ourselves and to others. And so that's why, you know, thinking about these things not as something outside of our teaching, but actually something that is affecting our teaching and our students learning constantly helps. Just the awareness itself of what testing can do is, I think, a little step in being a little bit more empowered as opposed to not even realizing that testing does these kinds of things. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, one thing that jumped out at me was when you asked the question, how to purposefully use translanguage in our pedagogy. Yeah. And I know since the early 80s when Krashen put out his five hypotheses, I, I remember during the, the 80s when Krashen had put out his five hypotheses, there was this kind of um, backlash against using the, uh, the L2 in the classroom but since that time, it's become more accepted. And um, I'm wondering to what extent do you think we should allow our students to use L2 in the classroom? And connected with that, how would we effectively and meaningfully allow them to use translanguage in our pedagogy? Excuse me. <clears throat> I wanted to drink water, but it went to the wrong side. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so New York is a wonderful place to talk about translanguaging. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are aware, but you have one of the biggest researchers on translanguaging here in New York, uh, Ophelia Garcia. So some of you may have encountered her work, gone to her talks, or seen the schools where she works and, and develops translanguaging with teachers and students and parents. It's a very complicated uh, issue. I support translanguaging. Um, I'm very interested also as a <clears throat> second language acquisition researcher to um, study translanguaging because I think it really reflects how we all use language. Some of us are socialized in our, in our different languages to sort of keep them separate. That's how we learn them, that's how we use them, and that's fine. <clears throat> but other, other people have been socialized <clears throat> by families, communities, or even teaching um, to use all their languages in different combinations and ways and to feel freer um, drawing from their language resources in, in different ways. When that is the case, when a multilingual has been socialized into translanguaging as a natural thing, it is very harmful to try to 
win them out out of that, right? To, to try to not, to, to teach them how to separate the languages, right? When someone has been socialized into learning each language separately and keeping them separately in use, it can be um, also difficult to be offered the opportunity through pedagogy to mix languages, to play with language. So I think this is a little bit, to some extent, in practice. Like it is this whole debate about communication and grammar, you know? Uh, maybe now we all have learned how to combine them quite well in our teaching, but professional discussions about, well, I need to teach them first the grammar, the vocabulary, the pronunciation, and then worry later about how they're going to use it. Or I need to expose them to communication and language, just speak, use, write, whatever, and then the accuracy of the grammar will sort itself out as it goes, right? The two extremes. And this played out during the, the 90s, mostly, discussions about, you know, immersion, education, is it good or bad? Does it have enough grammar in it? Traditional foreign language teaching in the States that is totally translation and grammar based. Does it have enough communication in it? And so people were exploring ways in which the two can be balanced. And the balance is going to look different in different places. When a teacher is totally hung up on grammar and form and the code and accuracy, the struggle is how to introduce a little bit of communication into that. When a teacher is totally about communication and nothing else, the struggle is how to fine tune a little bit of that language learning that needs to happen too. So with translanguaging, I think that in fact, in practice, that's probably what's happening in classrooms and that's what the research also can do. There will be teachers who are very comfortable letting their students just use different resources that they bring to the classroom and exploit them to learn better. Learn language better, learn content better. So maybe for them, we can work with them to also develop some versatility so that the students sometimes can also learn to perform with one language more or less separate and pure if that's going to be needed, say, when they're doing a job interview and the people interviewing them um, only speak English or only one language. But naturally, bilinguals know how to do that. So bilinguals do not translanguage constantly as a fix, at a fixed rate. Bilinguals know how to translanguage with whom and how much, depending on the context and the interlocutor. So it's not really necessarily a, a very true concern. But if they are translanguaging all the time and they're comfortable with that, part of the education may be to show them places where they can also try to cut uh, back a little bit on the translanguaging. And for people who have never experienced translanguaging, and so they're like absolutely at a loss, like how would you do that? I don't want to mix my languages, that's confusing. I won't learn English or this or that well. Maybe then for them the issue is moving them a little bit towards a less mono glossic understanding of what it means to be a, a good multilingual language user. The problem is more than anything devaluing ways of speaking, ways with words, just because they don't fit the standard educated one language only at a time ideal. That, that is the biggest problem, I think. But Ophelia Garcia should be the one you talk to for this. Um, as a follow-up to the, the previous question about translanguage in uh, pedagogy, I'm curious if there has been any research or if there is any study at all on whether uh, multilingual teachers whether they're in, in, in the world, in the sphere of uh, translinguistic pedagogy, if they're, if, mm -hmm. if they're more effective as teachers because they understand a bigger context of the lives of the students, yeah. not only linguistically. Is there any study on, on that or? Um, okay, there, there is a study by a researcher in Australia that I really, really appreciate, uh, Liz Ellis, Elizabeth Ellis. 
Uh, she has a book and she has an article in Tissot Quarterly or a couple of articles now in Tissot Quarterly. Um, she interviewed teachers of English who themselves have lots of um, language learning and language use experiences and she called them multilingual uh, or, or perhaps plurilingual uh, ESOL teachers. So her goal was to interview them and to understand how they use that multilingualism in the classroom and whether it makes them sort of better teachers in a way. And uh, she, she has a very beautiful um, account of how being a multilingual English teacher really helps empathize and know what your students are going through. So these were like English as a first language multilinguals who were teachers of English. So native speakers of English, but either they were um, you know, multilinguals, bilinguals uh, in the family and they grew up as such with English as one of their first languages or they were learning languages later on. Um, a lot of these teachers, the best virtue that they had is that they viewed language learning very realistically as, you know, it is absolutely perfectly possible. There's nothing impossible about learning languages, even if you're an adult or an old person. There's so much ageism in, in uh, language learning and teaching, right? So they were very sort of like, well, it's absolutely success and competence for adults learning new languages. Absolutely possible, sure. But then they were also very realistic. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. It's not gonna happen miraculously. Right? And they were also, um, many of them had stories about this language I learned great, this other language I speak great, this language I never was able to take it anywhere. I felt very frustrated, right? I was a failed student in this language. And yet they had no sense of deficit because of that. So they also saw less success in some languages as a very normal thing that is not about you and how good you are or how good, how good you are as a person. So they had these very um, empowering views about what it takes to, like, to learn language, how possible it is, but how much it takes as well. And that was very positive with their students. Now, to want to have research that shows that multilingual teachers are better than monolingual teachers, uh, I contemplated it for a while as a really good thing. Affirmative action, right? Reverse affirmative action. Any of us who have been non-native teachers of whatever language, I've been a non-native teacher of English, but I've been a native teacher of Spanish. I've done both, so I've worn both hats, right? So when, when I heard about, uh, what if we said, you know, non-native speakers are better than native speakers? and multilingual teachers are better than monolingual teachers. For a while I thought, yeah, we should get studies like that going, but it's just like a reverse affirmative action kind of thing, right? But lately, I've been changing, lately since 2016 elections. I've been changing my mind and I've been realizing that both multilingualism but also monolingualism are a matter of a continuum. They're not black and white categories. So it's also the case probably that monolingual is not a real thing, right? That we have diverse experiences with language or languages and that that makes us basically never monolingual. At least we have different registers and we've experienced linguicism of other forms, right? And I've been uh, observing that in my own life, I have very close people who are very multilingual, just like me, and I have very close people who are sort of like at the end of monolinguals, right? They're, they're mostly monolinguals, right? And I did see that their language ideologies are not just given by that, by the those two sets of experiences. So I have a brother who speaks English very well, and he is one of the most prescriptivist, linguistically prescriptivist people I know. 
and uh, is always making comments about whether my Spanish is good or whether I am changing my Spanish in bad ways after all these years of being a multilingual. Uh, but then I have my mom, who's a monolingual, she just speaks Spanish, right? Who absolutely does the opposite. She has a, a linguistic confidence and an attitude towards the openness of language that really allows me to thrive when I speak Spanish, when I speak English, or when I speak something else. Right? But she's monolingual. So if my brother teaches a language in the future, he would probably need to be helped <laughs> to change his language ideologies so that he teaches better for his students. But if my mom decided to become a language teacher, she would all already bring that with her, that kind of like liberal attitude towards the diversity and the openness of language. And she's a monolingual, so. So nowadays, yeah, there could be studies, but I think that probably the studies we need are more about how do we work with the very mixed and complex language ideologies that we all have? And if we're teachers, what do we need to pay attention to so that we do a better job teaching? But yeah, for a while I was like, monolingual, whoops, I don't care. I'm not gonna study them. Native speakers, I don't care. There's enough studies about them. Um, now I'm a little bit more. It's a matter of a continuum, it's not a fixed thing. Okay, so with that. Oh my God. <laughs> I hope we're all multilingual here. All right then, thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful talk.